Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. Uh, as most of you know, I'm Craig Snyder, the president uh, of the World Affairs Council of Philadelphia. I want to thank everybody uh, who's joining us today who used uh, our pay what you wish option for this program. Um, this is uh, among the last uh, of our online events, which we will be able to hold uh, in this way, uh, as we will shortly be rolling out a, a new registration system with options uh, for either a, a modest individual uh, event ticket price uh, or the ability to sign up as a sustaining monthly supporter of the council uh, in return for which uh, you will automatically uh, be registered for all of these online events. Uh, either way, uh, we are and, and will be grateful for your continued support as we work to bring you uh, this high quality content. Uh, if uh, any technical issues arise for you uh, during the program, please use the question bar and the Council's Vice President of Programs, Haley Boyle, will uh, be able to help you behind the scenes uh, in almost all cases. Um, as always, uh, later in the hour, we will uh, take uh, some audience questions. To ask a question, also just type that uh, into the question bar. Uh, our guest uh, for this afternoon, Barton Gelman, uh, is one of the leading uh, journalists of our generation. Uh, with Pulitzer Prizes and many other accolades uh, as badges of that stature, and his first book, Angler, uh, is the definitive reporting on the vice presidency as practiced uh, by Dick Cheney. Uh, all of that uh, was uh, Bart's career before the night uh, that a mysterious encrypted message arrived uh, from an anonymous source who turned out later to be Edward Snowden, uh, and the saga began of reporting uh, on the most consequential set of stories uh, ever published about the relationship between technology and privacy uh, and between uh, imperatives of our national security on the one hand and our liberty on the other. Bart's new book, uh, Dark Mirror, chronicles the Snowden story and his central role in that story. Um, it's really several books in one, part policy tone about thorny but unavoidable issues uh, in a world in which our democratic country faces threats to freedom from both external adversaries and perhaps as well from our own national security apparatus. It's part cloak and dagger storytelling about Edward Snowden and Bart's interactions with him. Um, and it's part a memoir of a life in investigative journalism. Reviewers have compared it uh, to All the President's Men by Woodward and Bernstein. Um, and there is simply no way that we can do justice to the richness of, of that three books in one uh, in the hour we have, or even any one of them, I'm afraid. Uh, so if you haven't done so already, uh, please do yourself a favor and read the book. Um, I'll tell you that um, I wrote 4,200 words of questions. Um, so uh, <laughs> we're, we're, not gonna, we're not gonna get through that uh, in this hour, but hopefully we will we'll leave you wanting more. Um, so I want to also apologize kind of as a preamble, uh, at least a little bit, uh, Bart, to you in advance, because some of the questions that the book raises are really more properly asked to Ed Snowden. Um, you're not here as a representative or an advocate of him, um, but because you've spent more time inside his head than, than certainly anybody else uh, watching here, um, it's basically irresistible to, to ask you to sort of speculate on what you think he thinks about a number of important things. Likewise, um, I'm not here to advocate on those, on behalf of those who criticize either Snowden or you, but of course, uh, arguments are, are, are better uh, tested and strengthened uh, by exposure to counter arguments. Uh, so uh, many of my questions will sort of be in that form. Uh, lastly, uh, by way of introduction and disclosure, um, as I indicated in uh, the announcement for this program, Bart is nearly a, a lifetime friend of mine. Uh, we met at George Washington High School in Northeast Philadelphia and shared a truly formative experience working together on our high school newspaper uh, when school authorities wouldn't allow us uh, to print stories on topics that they deemed inappropriate or damaging. Um, Bart recounts in Dark Mirror that when uh, Edward Snowden was essentially interviewing him uh, to determine uh, if he would give Bart access to the treasure trove of intelligent documents in his uh, possession, uh, that Bart told Snowden uh, that his, uh, his stripes as a defender of freedom of the press started with our high school newspaper. Um, so kudos to the Philadelphia public school system. I think it's kind of cool. Um, so with that, 
let's uh, let's begin. Um, so Bart, uh, my first question starts, uh, I guess, sort of from what is in in some respects your conclusion, overarching conclusion, and then we'll kind of work backwards from that. Uh, you wrote that you believe and that the reader of your book is entitled to know uh, that you think uh, Snowden did substantially more good than harm. So I guess I want to start by asking you to lay out what you think the two sides of that equation are. What's the harm he did? What's the good he did? And how do you balance them? So Ed Snowden had a huge impact on uh, the global information ecosystem uh, and on the state of democratic debate in our country about what the boundaries and limits of intelligence gathering ought to be, especially vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the government's relationship with its own citizens. Uh, and so the internet is a much more secure place than it would have been without him and than it was without him. Uh, if you uh, don't remember, uh, back then, seven years ago, when you browsed to just about any place on the web, uh, you didn't have a little lock icon in your um, in, in, in the address bar up on the browser. Uh, it was open HTTP, not HTTPS. The S stands for secure, and that is now the standard uh, for almost all websites on the internet. Uh, you can hardly find a major website that does not encrypt its connection between uh, its server and your computer. And that leaves you much safer from hackers, from malware, from uh, spies, and from ordinary intrusions on privacy. Uh, it's been a great thing for the global economy, uh, as well as for privacy. And second of all, uh, really first in my own mind, uh, Snowden enabled a public debate about secret changes in the powers assumed by the intelligence community uh, that were not being debated because they were done without the knowledge of the public. Uh, that since 9-11, uh, the NSA in particular had intruded further and further into the what I would call the global commons of the internet, uh, going into places where everybody else uh, hung out on the web and on email. And, uh, and grabbing information from those places in ways that it had not done before, in ways that the public still did not know or believe that it was doing. And that, that balance you asked me to, to, uh, to draw is between, uh, or sort of among the values of security and self-government and privacy. Uh, and security cuts more than one way. I, I already told you one way in which I think security has been in, increased. Uh, by the encryption of the internet, uh, which resulted from Snowden's disclosures. Uh, but there's no way he could have disclosed so much about intelligence gathering without harming some of the collection itself. Um, Snowden does not like to acknowledge uh, that any damage was done by his disclosures. I think it's not possible to imagine that it wasn't done. Uh, we don't know what the damage was exactly uh, for a variety of reasons, most of them being uh, that the damage itself would be classified. The NSA is not um, giving examples. Uh, also because collection would have changed in the interim whether or not he made any disclosures. Uh, the internet is, the global communication system is the most complicated machine collectively ever built. And every day something changes in that machine that upends a surveillance technique that the NSA was using, you know, version 3.0 comes along and the version 2.0 vulnerability is no longer there that the NSA was exploiting. Uh, Facebook changes a protocol, somebody adds a new junction to the physical uh, structure of the internet, so forth and so on, uh, and you're going to lose some collection. So I, I say he did more good than harm because the democratic debate was essential and the security needs were grave. Uh, and because we're still standing. Okay, second part of that I think is, um, is why you, um, in two senses, um, why do you think that, that Snowden chose you uh, for this uh, really uh, uh, challenging, perhaps burdensome responsibility of sorting through this vast archive of state secrets? 
um, and deciding uh, in, in cooperation ultimately with the Washington Post what would be made public and what would. So it's good that you mentioned the sorting. Uh, Snowden is often uh, kind of mixed up in people's minds with Julian Assange and they're very different. Snowden did not decide to take a larger archive of secret material and place it all on the web uh, and let everyone sort through it. Uh, he did not want that. In fact, he argued with Assange about it. Uh, Assange was angry that he didn't uh, release all the material through him. He wanted journalists to sift through it to decide what was newsworthy and what was going to do too much harm to release. And uh, he, he said that he didn't trust his own judgment on those questions uh, and wanted independent judgments. Uh, he didn't choose me at first. He chose first Glenn Greenwald who because he wanted a strong voice of advocacy uh, for his own positions. He wanted someone who wasn't in oppositional uh, position with the U.S. government who would be a tribune of uh, anger and denunciation against abuse. Um, he then chose Laura Poitras, the filmmaker, um, who was herself under significant surveillance from the state. She was, she had found herself and, and became known for having found herself under scrutiny every time she crossed a border. She would get secondary searches. The immigration authorities would um, would image her devices and her, her uh, memory cards, uh, make copies of all her raw film and so on. So he knew that she was interested in security and was under scrutiny herself and thought he would find a sympathizer that way. Laura came to me. Laura needed help uh, trying to assess whether this anonymous source who uh, said only that he was a member of the intelligence community, whether he was for real, whether the things that he was telling her uh, were authentic. Uh, she knew I knew something about the subject and we started working together. Uh, but before we started working together in any significant way, Snowden had to approve. And Snowden saw the appeal of having, you know, someone from the mainstream media uh, involved and someone who knew something about the subject, but he worried that the Washington Post would be afraid to publish the stories. I thought that was a fanciful concern myself, but he took some convincing. So um, you say that uh, Snowden is, uh, to this day, uh, in, in Russia, essentially by accident. Um, that he was supposed to be just changing planes in Moscow when his passport uh, was rendered invalid. Um, so it seems to me that may be uh, how he, he got there, but it's surely no accident uh, that he remains there. Uh, it's a choice, right, of, uh, of Vladimir Putin, a choice of, of the Russian government, uh, and a choice that one could certainly argue is made because Putin believes that Snowden's presence there uh, is in some way harmful to the United States, or at least annoying to the government of the United States. Um, so for those who, who agree with you that, uh, that Snowden did much more good than, than harm, um, is, it, is there a, a way to sort of resolve the irony uh, that someone who cares so much about the power of a state and, and, and a surveillance state is living in a surveillance state, clearly much worse than the United States. Well, Snowden is aware of the irony, and irony happens sometimes. Uh, there's no doubt in my mind that you're right that Putin tolerates his presence uh, and maybe even embraces it, who knows, uh, because he finds that it will, it's a, it's a good way at least to tweak the United States. He gets to be the uh, keeper of the civil libertarian, the, the political dissident um, who was who, who uh, exposed uh, wrongdoing by the righteous United States. Uh, uh, he is the protector of, uh, of, of an asylee in this case. It, it's an amusing position for him to be in. I'm sure he enjoys it. Uh, Snowden is there because he has no place else to go. Uh, he, his passport was revoked while he was midair on his way to uh, Russia to change planes to Latin America. Uh, and so Russia said, you don't have papers to go anywhere else and eventually gave him asylum. He could, of course, return to the United States. The U.S. government would be happy to have him back and to uh, place him on trial. And that's a choice that Snowden has not made. 
So, um, so yes, yeah, so the, the, the critics would say the, the, the other place he has, he has the ability to go is, is the ability to have a day, a day in court and, and, uh, and be tried. Um, you, you write uh, about a conversation that, uh, uh, to which you were witness, uh, I guess, a virtual conversation between Snowden uh, and the Pentagon Papers, uh, the very famous Pentagon Papers leaker, uh, Daniel Ellsberg, and in, in which um, if I have this right, uh, Snowden uh, says to Ellsberg uh, essentially that he, he won't allow himself to be prosecuted under laws that he believes are, are, are unjust, are illegitimate. Um, do you think that's a reasonable position to take? It's not the traditional uh, position of civil disobedience, uh, which is uh, I believe the law is unjust, uh, I'm going to break the law demonstratively, and I'm then going to subject myself to it. Uh, I will accept the consequences. Uh, Snowden is choosing not to accept the consequences. Uh, that's not a decision that I'm really in a position to judge. It, here, the, the, the thing that he says that is not seriously in dispute is that he can't have his day in court in any traditional sense that people would understand that to mean. Uh, there is no doubt that he violated the law uh, as it's written, and there is no public interest defense available to him. Now, what he says is that if I could come back and say, here is why I believed it was justified, here's why the public needed to know this information, and here's my evidence that I was not working for some foreign intelligence service I was working on behalf of the American people. If he could do that and it would have any impact on his guilt or on his sentence, he says that he would be prepared to go forward. Uh, the law under which he's charged, the Espionage Act, uh, treats talking to a reporter the same as if, as if he would, had talked directly to a foreign intelligence officer. Uh, and so the only factual question is, did he have lawful access to classified information and did he then give it to someone who did not have that access? Uh, so even if it turned out that every single program he exposed was declared unconstitutional by the U.S. Supreme Court, um, he would still be guilty, uh, and he doesn't see the fairness in that. So people in the intelligence community, you write about people in the intelligence community telling you um, that Snowden was lying to you, that he was playing you, um, and that uh, in, in sort of in, in the height of the reporting, uh, you didn't have much uh, much if any evidence to to support that. Uh, but but then you you go on to to tell a pretty dramatic uh, anecdote uh, about uh, Snowden telling you he had wiretapped the emails of the Congressional Gang of Eight and the entire U.S. Supreme Court uh, only later years later to uh, tell you that that had not happened. Um, with that hindsight. Does it alter your sense of uh, of his truthfulness overall? So I was very disappointed to learn that this large claim he made early on was untrue. Um, I had never published the claim because uh, it was just uh, something that he said he did. And it would only be a story if I could authenticate that. Uh, and if I knew, I mean, I would have to have supporting details. I would have to know. Well, what did you find, for example? How did you do it? How, why should I believe that you did it? Um, the thing about Snowden is I did not rely on his word for almost anything uh, in the course of the story. He gave me source documents, and, and, and uh, it was the documents themselves and the other people I spoke to who could authenticate them and who could talk about uh, what the programs were, what the technical meaning of the, uh, of the operations was. Uh, those were the people I relied on for stories. So I, I very seldom quoted him, except to ask him about his own life in Moscow in one story. Uh, so it didn't make me reconsider my coverage uh, to find that he had spun me. And it's also true, in fairness to him, that he was among the most reliable sources I've had. Uh, for someone who I had spent, you know, way over 100 hours um, in conversation with, uh, he often said, I don't know, which is a good sign because no one knows everything. Uh, when he, when he made an assertion of specific fact, uh, with this one exception, 
Um, I never found him to to be uh, to be untruthful. Uh, he was desperate at the beginning. It was it was one of the very first things he ever said to me was that he had done this. He was trying to say, look, you have to understand this is a system in which any analyst can wiretap anyone. And uh, his view remains today that that is true. Uh, and he made up a dramatic example to try to convince me at a time when he didn't think I believed him or would necessarily believe him. And to do so, uh, he told me something untrue. And that was uh, disappointing. But as I worked along with him throughout, um, I didn't find that to be something that had happened again. So I, I want to go back to um, to uh, the sort of what I've called you sort of the overarching conclusion um, that uh, you believe Snowden did substantially more good than harm. You say even though you're prepared to accept uh, that uh, the disclosures must have exacted a price in lost intelligence. Um, so, but I want to sort of ask you to to, to think about. Uh, what, what I know some have said on this subject, which is that maybe the question of harm isn't about specific lost intelligence, but rather about a kind of broader cultural and policy shift away from primary attention on very real external enemies uh, and, and shifting that attention to potential or, or perceived internal threats uh, to, to freedom. Uh, so I believe it was the bin Laden uh, raid commander, Admiral Mc, McRaven, who at one point uh, you recount in the book sort of yells at you that uh, the main reason there have not been any further 9-11s, uh, no additional mass destruction attacks uh, on the United States, um, is because of the diligence and the expansive application of technology uh, to try to stop these things uh, by the NSA and the intelligence community. Um, so I guess my question is, did, did, did Snowden, in your view, contribute to an attitude among Americans that they should be more concerned about dangers from their own government than dangers in the wider world? So that, I will tell you, Craig, is a kind of harm that I cannot accept as harm to be weighed against Snowden in a, what I view as a proper understanding of a democratic society. You can't say that it did harm because it caused people to form the wrong opinions uh, and thereby to seek uh, to exert their collective sovereignty over their own government. Uh, they say the government works for us. And if we become collectively convinced that the government has overstepped and gone too far, uh, you can't say, well, see, now this disclosure caused you to think hard about this question and form the wrong conclusions as far as we're concerned, and therefore it shouldn't have been disclosed. That's not how it works in a democracy. Um, we actually get to decide what we care about. And, and from our founding days, we have been very concerned about unchecked power. Uh, and the reason I titled the book Dark Mirror is uh, to bring to bear the sort of image of uh, a mirror that you can see through on one side, uh, and that's the side that looks at us where the government can watch us and see everything transparently. And then we look at the other side and it's opaque. We don't get to watch them watching us. And that is a profoundly damaging relationship for people to have to its government um, in a self-governing society. Uh, and the cure, if you think that Snowden has caused us to think too much or unrealistically about dangers from our own government and too little about dangers from overseas is more talk, is more conversation, is more disclosure, uh, is uh, sort of the right kind of uh, political candidate and the right kind of uh, governing authorities and the right kind of editorials and the newspapers and so on. Uh, you, get, you get to engage fully in that debate. You don't get to engage in it by making sure that people don't know what their government is doing to them. So there's a, another uh, of these uh, sort of testy conversations that, that you had uh, with uh, people inside the intelligence community uh, as this process unfolded, in which uh, Admiral Blair uh, says to you that the Snowden disclosures don't show abuse of power, but rather the creation of a system that could be seen to have a potential for an abuse of power. 
Um, and, and in a certain sense, it, it seems to me that Snowden actually said much the same thing to you, uh, that uh, what he was exposing was the creation of a, a quote, turnkey tyranny, uh, which was sort of ready to be abused, could be abused by the wrong American government. Um, my question, though, is, again, sort of about, about mass impressions from the Snowden episode and whether or not the mass impression was that the government was in fact engaged in tyrannical acts, as opposed to that there had been created a technological infrastructure that might be abused at some point. I think you're right about that. I think that there's uh, been a real confusion in the public debate. Uh, it, it is the case that uh, the government can do a lot of things that it has not chosen to do. Uh, you know, we don't have a Stasi. We, you know, our government is not uh, spying on everyone all the time um, in an effort to root out dissent or enforce conformity or any of the things that uh, that uh, a totalitarian state armed with this kind of surveillance technology could do. Uh, that doesn't mean that the uh, that the the issue is moot. It doesn't mean that there's no problem with it. Uh, sometimes just building the apparatus, even if it's used beneficently, uh, even if it's used with some self-restraint, uh, could be a dangerous thing to do. I mean, if the government said, from now on, because of magic new gadget we've invented, uh, we're going to take an inventory of every object that you own in every house. Um, we can automate that and humans won't look at it. Uh, so if you buy something or sell something, you get something as a present, uh, we'll only look at it if we have a really good reason. Uh, but we're gonna have this complete record of everything that belongs to everyone. You would find that creepy, um, I think. Uh, you would find it disturbing. You would be able to imagine all kinds of ways in which that would, could be subject to abuse. You would take note of the fact that over time, uh, the use made of large data sets uh, tends to expand, and it's sort of a one-way valve. You say, well, we, we gathered it for this purpose, but it would really be useful for this other purpose as well, and we could use it to solve crimes because a handbag disappeared from one house and appeared in another one, and we can connect the two, and this must be the thief. And once you can do it with crimes, you can do it with all kinds of other behavior that you'd like to control. And 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 pretty soon you do have a, a complete uh, sort of panopticon. And there are aspects of the surveillance machinery today that Snowden believes, and, and I have to say I believe, are too dangerous to have built and maintained. That there are some things that the government should not be able to do if it can, if it can, uh, restrain itself from doing that. So um, there's a quote in, in the in the book uh, in which you say, um, I did not blame law enforcement or intelligence officials for wanting unrestricted access. The job was the father of the wish. That did not mean a well-tuned republic should grant the wish. Um, my question is, isn't the reverse of that also true? In other words, your job as a reporter was father to your wish that you be able to have access uh, to these uh, secrets and to be able to decide uh, which of them should be presented to the public. People raise questions as to whether a well-tuned republic should give that much power to reporters. Uh, how do you answer those critics? Right. So the less polite way to say that is, you know, who the hell elected me to decide what secrets should be spilled? And uh, I would say uh, structurally, uh, our system of government has elected me to play my part in that. Uh, reporters don't get to decide and shouldn't get to decide where overall the boundary between secrecy and disclosure lies. Um, we don't get to decide um, which of the, you know, tens of billions of secrets are classified uh, and stamped secret and uh, placed in a, in a, in a, in away from public eyes and in a way that's enforceable by law. Uh, there are 4 million people with classified access 
in this country. Uh, by one academic estimate, um, there is more information, more data that is that exists in the classified secret realm than all the all the rest of the data in the United States. Uh, that there is there is more secret data than open data, uh, just by volume. Uh, you have a large apparatus designed to enforce that, and most of the secrets are kept. I mean, there's no there's no way to argue that any substantial proportion of all the government's classified secrets are spilt. Uh, there are there is a competition for a certain category of secrets, which are secrets that have uh, uh, public value uh, that are relevant to a public debate that reporters are trying to find out and government is trying to keep us from finding out. And if the government were successful at that um, all the time, then we would never have learned uh, about torture. Um, we would never have learned about um, illegal, just flat out illegal, um, warrantless wiretapping. Uh, we wouldn't have found out that the uh, US government conducted medical experiments on servicemen uh, after World War II to see what's the effect of nuclear radiation on human health um, or conducted experiments on mentally ill people to find out, to, to sort of expose them to syphilis and watch how it progresses when it's left untreated. Um, these were all things that were protected by classification. Donald Trump recently said uh, that he believes every single conversation that anyone ever has with him is classified. Um, that as far as he's concerned, it's all classified. And the problem with that is, uh, in a literal way, um, he's, if he were more confident, um, he would be capable of uh, enacting that as the law. The classification system works entirely on the say-so of the president. So what the president says is classified is classified. Uh, there is no appeal. There is no other branch that has anything to do with it. And my view is that um, this, the conflicting uh, values of self-government and self-defense make it so that we cannot trust either the president to decide what we need to know about him uh, in order to hold him accountable, or a reporter like me to know uh, what keeps us secure. And so you have to have, ultimately, a certain unregulated aspect of the competition. It's sort of like asking me, how dare I purport to set the price of milk? I'm setting the price of milk for my, you know, in my little store, in my little corner of the street. Uh, it's 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 uh, it's the invisible hand. It is it is a um, a collective collective system that is deciding which secrets ultimately spill. And normally, I would argue we get the balance about right as a society. So clearly, both uh, both Snowden and and really in in your own voice here and in the book, um, you're making an argument for. Uh, transparency and accountability in democratic decision making when it comes to national security matters. Um, but we don't have a plebiscitory, a plebiscitory democracy, right? We have a representative government. And right. your account shows that these practices were continued through presidents of both parties, uh, that they were. Uh, uh, at least in the broad sense, subject to oversight uh, by Congress. In fact, there's there's a there's a quote in 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 the book that that uh, in in which you say, um, uh, uh, can't remember at the moment who you were quoting, but you said, uh, no member of Congress ever asked whether uh, U.S. intelligence went too far, collected too much, or put too much privacy at risk. The only thing. Uh, that Congress ever asked of the intelligence community was, how did you fail to find something? How did you fail to anticipate something? So you had a bipartisan consensus and you had both political, both representative branches of government buying into uh, this policy. Uh, doesn't the consensus within our representative government mean something arguably more than Snowden's belief that it was the wrong policy. Well, it was it was a, a bold statement for Snowden to make that he could represent the public's interest um, in some way that the public's elected and appointed representatives um, could not. And that pissed off a lot of 
people in government. Uh, they thought it was hubris, and you can't argue with that. Uh, he uh, he had the zeal that is common to whistleblowers. Uh, he believed that there were things the public needed to know uh, that it, that it was uh, being lied to, uh, that it was that it were things that were being withheld from the public. And here's the thing: the way you know that the system wasn't working as designed is that the public was actually uh, by the by the polls and by behavior and by consumer behavior was outraged and concerned and worried about what it learned from these stories. Uh, there was enormous market pressure on Google and Facebook and Yahoo and Microsoft to secure their connections, uh, that they the public did not want to believe that its private data were was an open book um, to government and and didn't like it. And if the harm that you want to describe is that uh, Democratic representatives, um, once they learn what the public thinks, are going to change their views and vote for reform, which they did. Um, uh, then you're not defending uh, representation in your idea of represent, representative government. You're you're uh, you're defending kind of a closed club. So um, one of the questions that that I was sort of wrestling with in in reading the book is um, whether or not what Snowden was primarily concerned with was. Uh, the the spying on America and the potential to spy on Americans, or whether it was actually something broader. And I think there's sort of evidence to, to, in, in in both directions. But in terms of the of the one direction, again, in, in your your recounting uh, the conversation with Daniel Ellsberg, you said that Snowden told Ellsberg that he believed that our Constitution protects everybody not just U.S. persons, not just U.S. citizens, implying, it seems to me, a, a belief that American intelligence uh, was not just problematic because it was scooping up uh, uh, American data, uh, but really questioning foreign intelligence. Um, and there's another, uh, another quote elsewhere in, in the book where he sort of talks about uh, uh, trying to protect uh, the city of the world from the dueling Godzilla and, and Mothra monsters. Um, so, I mean, it, it, was there, you know, was there a kind of, you could call it anti-Americanism, or you could just call it a kind of global citizen view on his part that uh, that went far beyond the idea of I'm trying to protect the privacy of Americans from what may be an overreach by by government. That's true. Uh, at, I mean, look. The, in the book, I have you know, an, a huge amount of raw material that just shows you this This is the conversation I was having with Snowden on this day. Here are our words. Uh, so you can watch the progression of arguments about these things and distinctions and conversations that we were making. I, the, likewise, I've got you know many scenes of sitting down with national security officials who for a while were so angry they wouldn't talk to me at all, and then sitting down and working through the issues with them. Uh, and those are fascinating conversations. Uh, Snowden has a universalist view of privacy uh, that is not my own, uh, in which he believes that everyone has the right to be left alone and not to be spied upon, uh, provided that there's no probable cause to believe they're doing something wrong. That is not at all the way we organize intelligence gathering. Um, that's a, a quite radical critique of intelligence gathering. It's not one that I share. Um, I believe that there is an essential place for intelligence gathering in a free society that uh, we need to know what our adversaries and our competitors are up to. Uh, and even so, there are things the US government does uh, strictly to foreigners that might give us pause. Uh, so it's one thing to say, of course you want the NSA to be spying on terrorists. Uh, that's the easy case. Or of course, um, it's fine uh, it's just natural and normal in the course of, of uh, foreign affairs that governments are going to spy on other governments. But you know, what if, what if you are 
breaking into and delving deep into the lives of system administrators because they offer you a, a way uh, that, that work for some third party country uh, that's not, not, not a competitor at all, just an ally. But they make an important part for a machine that the NSA wants to break somewhere else. Uh, and so you, uh, you, you, uh, you suborn the accounts of some four engineers sitting in the Netherlands. Um, and you start looking at what they're doing there, um, and it looks a little funny. If you, if you see 160,000 um, conversations that are intercepted uh, under a program called PRISM, which I did see, uh, and you see that there's hundreds and hundreds of pages just in one, you know, one couple of, of a, a man and woman struggling to define their relationship and to decide whether they're going to get married and what it meant that they had sex and all kinds of other intimate things. And it's just sitting there in NSA files. And it's known to be not relevant to any uh, foreign intelligence purpose, but they don't, once they collect it, they don't throw it away anymore. Um, and you start to get a creepy feeling uh, from some of what the government does, even if it involves foreigners. So uh, there's a really, uh, one of these, another one of these really fascinating conversations that you recount uh, with Snowden. Uh, so in, in 2013, he poses to you a hypothetical to illustrate how dangerous it is for the American government to have the capacity to collect personal communications. And he, he says, quote, what if I had been a real political partisan who hated the Democrats and Obama and collected every Democratic official's emails between now and the upcoming elections, then, then would have been the midterm elections in 2014, um, and leaked them out as an October surprise. Think about the implications for our, the way our system of governance works, uh, he says. So, of course, you note that that's exactly what Russian intelligence uh, did uh, against the, the Democratic campaign in 2016. Um, but, the, but it was the Russians who did it, not, uh, not the American government. Um, and, and, and the Obama administration, though, you know, it would be hard to overstate the Obama administration's preference for the election of Hillary Clinton over Donald Trump. Um, the Obama administration did not use the surveillance capabilities of the United States to try to sink uh, Trump uh, or even to expose what the Russians were doing to aid him. So I'm sort of going back to this, this, this macro question about a world in which we have adversaries that don't play by any rules. Um, and we're trying to decide what the constraints are on our own rules uh, and how those two things fit together in your view. Well, look, we have, our adversaries don't give due process in court. Uh, they don't have an exclusionary rule. Uh, they don't have a fourth amendment. Um, that doesn't mean we want to model our criminal justice system after theirs, um, quite the reverse. Uh, we don't compete with our global adversaries by adopting their more repressive, uh, repressive features. And there, you get a lot of comments from people in the NSA about, you know, we were, we were probably the most highly regulated uh, intelligence service in the world, uh, and sort of complaining about it. Uh, we're sometimes proud of it. There's sometimes both. Uh, and you say, well, yeah, that's appropriate. This is America. We, we are suspicious of power. We want constraints on power. We are suspicious of secret law over, uh, you know, more than most things. Uh, and there were secret laws. Uh, the, the whole idea of secret law is kind of an abomination uh, in, in our jurisprudence. Uh, but there were legal boundaries that were changed in secret. And the U.S. government was lying about it. Uh, you know, or if it wasn't a lie, it was as close as you need to get uh, to call it a lie. I have the example in the book. There, there was a uh, a large NSA program collecting all the phone records of all Americans, uh, everybody they called, no matter whether it was across the street or across the world. And this depended on a provision of the Patriot Act called Section 215, and the section had been controversial. And uh, the government gave reports every year on how much it was used, and they, and they portrayed it as being used cautiously with great restraint in small numbers of cases. Here in 2009, look at this, we only used it 21 times. 
And it turned out that if you if you take 12 of those 21 times that it used Section 215, they got one trillion phone records uh, from which which were essentially the phone records of all Americans with 12 of those. So who knows what they did with the other <laughs> the other half of the group? Uh, and uh, you know you try to come up with a an analogy, and it's hard to find one in the non-digital world. But I said, suppose you're teenage daughter throws a party while you're out of town and she gets caught and, and she admits to you, but she says, look, I only invited 21 people. Then you later find out that 1 trillion teenagers came. Uh, you would probably feel like she had lied to you, even if it's true, she only invited 21. Uh, and that's what the government was doing. It was playing word games like that to hide important things from the, from the American people. Um, so towards the end of the book, um, when you're talking about some of these uh, more recent encounters that you that you've had with uh, the former intelligence officials, um, there's there is what I, I think can be characterized as a, 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 a at least raising a question as to whether or not um, Snowden's worth to American society, so to speak, is is more clear because of the election of Donald Trump. Um, is is that your view uh, that that hindsight um, makes uh, Snowden look better because uh, you believe there are real concerns uh, about the possibility of executive overreach with Trump? Yeah, that that is my view, and it is the view of some of the senior intelligence officials that I talked to. Um, I had a long three-hour breakfast with uh, James Clapper, who had been who had recently retired then um, as the director of national intelligence. And I reminded him, and he had kind of a look of distaste on his, on his face when I, when I attributed anything to Snowden, but I said one of Snowden's big points was what he called turnkey tyranny, that you could build this machine and it's all properly restrained and the law restricts it, but all you have to do is change a few words in the law or a few lines of code and now it can do all kinds of things uh, that you swore you wouldn't do. And he said, that is always a possibility. You never know who's gonna come along. And Clapper said that he had dismissed that uh, when he was in government. He trusted the accountability measures. He trusted the president, uh, whether it was the Republican or Democrat. He trusted himself. He trusted his colleagues and his peers uh, to do the right thing with this power. But when Trump came in and showed uh, what a president can do, um, who is lawless, uh, who has no respect for norms uh, and traditions and restraint, uh, he started to think again and he started wondering whether it's possible that they had gone too far. I found that fascinating. Uh, I, you know, it, it's not hard to look back if you're, if you're, you know, sitting in the middle of the Obama administration and say, well, don't forget J. Edgar Hoover, don't forget Richard Nixon used uh, these intelligence powers against his political enemies and say, well, you know, that was then, we've reformed, we've changed. Then, then along comes Donald Trump and he makes you question everything again. Okay, so I'm looking at the clock and I want to ask you a sort of a, a kind of an epilogue question. Um, so uh, here's, a, here's another quote from, uh, fr from your work. Um, Methodological collection and storage of geolocation information on, on cell phones uh, meant that the government was tracking all of those devices into confidential business meetings or personal visits to medical facilities, hotel rooms, private homes, and other traditionally protected spaces. No refuge, no haven, no place the U.S. government would accept as a sanctuary. So the, the, the epilogue question is, in the wake of the pandemic, a new, uh, a new physical threat to safety, uh, you know, sort of re replacing in, in, in the mind of a lot of people, uh, terrorism or, or, or foreign uh, concerns. Um, isn't it quite likely that most Americans uh, will voluntarily submit shortly, uh, some already have, to really exactly that sort of use of their cell phones uh, as, a as a tracking device? in connection with tracking and tracing uh, the movement uh, of the virus. And, and if that is true, um, then uh, the programs that Snowden disclosed ostensibly to protect 
programs that had been ostensibly to protect against terrorist threats, maybe uh, maybe a majority of Americans would have supported them had they been put to a to a plebiscite. Um, I mean, I guess but my point is the concern for privacy that Americans have seems to be relative to the sense of threat. And with respect to the threat of the virus, there may be um, uh, a, a quite widespread willingness to, to give up a great degree of privacy and turn your fel cell phone into a tracking device um, to try to minimize that threat. Um, so isn't it then a question of whether the threat is real and how big the threat is real, rather than a question of a sort of invaluable and in, inviolate space of privacy? Right, we don't have very many rights that are inviolate, uh, that, uh, that don't have to be balanced against other important social interests. Uh, and we accept intrusion and regulation all the time. Uh, and, and those boundaries change, they changed after a wave of hijackings in the 1970s uh, and then after 9-11. And so every time you get on an airplane, there's a new intrusive uh, uh, <laughs> method of, of, of uh, making sure you're not a threat. I, I would not assume, uh, and so actually the general point there is that it's not that the surveillance was necessarily wrong. It's that doing it secretly uh, and mendaciously uh, and keeping it away from the American public was wrong. I, I would have no objection. I might have my own views as a citizen, but I have no objection if uh, this had all been done out in the open and the American people um, accepted it, uh, then it wouldn't be a story for me. It wouldn't be a big disclosure because we would have known. Whether the American people are going to accept uh, tracking because of COVID is an open question. Uh, it may, it's also an open question whether we'll even be asked there's been a lot of talk about uh, turning smartphones into co smart contact tracers. Uh, the idea being that you would uh, track some combination of location uh, and proximity uh, so that uh, my device was uh, 10 feet away from yours for a period of at least 15 minutes and therefore were considered to have been uh, entangled in some way. And if one of us later reports that uh, we tested positive for COVID, then the other is going to be notified. Uh, there are ways of doing that uh, with a lot of privacy protection uh, uh, in which there is actually no central database aware of everyone's location. That's the way that Apple and Google have designed their, uh, their interface. It's called an API, an application program interface. It's uh, it's a set of procedures that someone can use to build an app that would do tracking. Uh, if you use the Apple Google toolkit, then the government won't get a complete record of where everyone's been. The government will only get uh, matches when the devices do the matching on their own uh, and, and voluntarily give it up. Then the government will say Bart's device and Craig's device match during a period when Bart may have been infectious. Uh, I, I would care a lot about where the data goes, who gets it, what purpose it uh, it has, what purpose it's allowed to uh, shift into, whether there will be a, um, a sunset point when the data will be destroyed, whether the rules are uh, a matter of law and legally binding, or whether they're just guidelines or terms and conditions that we can change any time, uh, as is often the case in the technology world. Uh, and so on. Um, I could see a case for using this stuff, but I actually haven't heard much talk from public health experts that they're the ones who want this. This strikes me as being something that um, originated in the technology world where they said, here's a cool thing we could do. We think you're doing it the old, the old way you have of contact tracing is inefficient. We, can, we have a better idea. We'll see whether public health people even want that. And since the federal government is not assuming it's normal central role in governing public health. Uh, it's There is no federal government effort to build an app uh, to do this. So some state governments are trying to do it. Some private companies are trying to do it. Um, it's kind of a mess at the moment. But even if we were presented with a national uh, tell us where you are app on our phones uh, that would uh, report this all the time for public health purposes, I would predict there would be a lot of resistance to that. I, I don't think that that would be so easily accepted. 
Okay, we got a couple of questions from uh, from the audience. We're going to get to. Um, I'm going to take one minute and close a blind since I seem to have wandered into a sunset. Give me a second here. All right. Ahead. I can hear your questions if you want to. Okay. Ask. Question is: um, Did any agents lose their lives as a result of the Snowden disclosures? I can't know that. Uh, I doubt it because the uh, the kinds of disclosures he made weren't typically the kind that uh, get people in trouble like that. Uh, he he did not. Uh, I mean, there were no stories that published you know, sort of identities of clandestine officers in the field and that sort of thing. Uh, there were things in the documents that I thought did uh, create a risk of immediate harm uh, to uh, to lives, uh, and they were not things that Snowden particularly wanted me to publish. Um, he he offered no opinion on what I should publish um, after the first story. Uh, so there were things in there I think I would say that could have led to uh, someone being discovered in a, in a dangerous place and uh, and harmed, but I have no reason to think that it did happen. I I have some reason to think that if it happened, that the U.S. government would find a way of getting that word out uh, because they wanted to uh, they wanted to discredit Snowden. And that was a, a claim that uh, they would have wanted to make if they could have made it. OK, um, would it have taken. Hang on, here we go. One more. Sorry. Uh, would it have taken another Snowden type of uh, expose in order to get internet and data security enhancements deployed of the sort that you mentioned early on? I, I guess, in essence, is that what it took to get the improvements in security that, that you noted at the outset? Well, there's no doubt that there's a strong relationship of cause and effect here. Uh, I wrote a story that said that the NSA, with its British counterpart, the GCHQ, was breaking into the the private links between Microsoft and Google and Yahoo data centers overseas. Uh, it was breaking into the sort of mother load of traffic uh, when Google is talking to itself from one enormous data center to the other and uh, and grabbing content. And that that worked because when Google was talking only to itself and not using the public internet, it didn't think it had to encrypt um, its traffic. The NSA said, aha, look what, what, look what I found. Uh, so Google and Microsoft and Yahoo immediately started encrypting that. And Yahoo, which had resisted for years, uh, was, was being heavily lobbied by privacy advocates to encrypt the links between its servers and its users. Uh, to put that HTTPS at the top of your browser bar had refused for years. Uh, and immediately after these Snowden stories broke and the one that I just described broke, um, it embarked on a hurry up effort to spend tens of millions of dollars to do exactly that. Uh, I'm not sure what else could have moved the tech industry. The tech industry was interested in uh, building new things um, and innovation and uh, and new services and new features and security was simply not in demand by consumers and uh, security and privacy and it, it just wasn't served by them. All right, uh, I'm gonna uh, thank you uh, once again for, for joining us tonight and uh, tell everybody that we really have only scratched the surface of uh, um, the rich the richness of this book in all its aspects. So uh, So if you haven't already gotten it, Go do so. For this evening, we're adjourned. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Craig.